Welcome to Diabetic Highs and Lows, Life Alongside Diabetes, a short series where I sit down with a member of my family and discuss what it's like living with a chronic illness when you aren't the one with the chronic illness. And for this episode, we have your brother, Christopher. And we'll be talking about a bread that was suggested by him. That's a kind of family favorite. And that is sour cream and chive rolls. They were so good. From Claire <laughs> Saffet's book, Dessert Person. So They were amazing. We're really excited. And pardon my voice. <laughs> I've lost it. <laughs> All right, so this week we are talking about the sour cream and chive rolls from Claire Saffet's book, Dessert Person. Um, now, these were suggested to us by Christopher, who is the guest for this episode of Highs and Lows. Um, and it's one that they came across on Bon Appetit, which is where Claire Saffet's used to work. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that business. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Uh, so Claire Saffitz is a fantastic baker and chef and has not only this book, but a, now a YouTube channel based off of her work with the book. And she's kind of expanded on that now. Um, and so I highly recommend it. I've followed it for quite some time. She's amazing. Uh, but this, this recipe, uh, is one that their family, brother Christopher and, uh, the, the kids, and his wife have made, and he said that it might be his very favorite. <laughs> they are really good. We couldn't stop ourselves eating them. <laughs> Which is um, kind of an issue <laughs> when the recipe makes 24 <laughs> dinner rolls. They're not like small ones. So Yeah. Uh, this is a fun recipe you could make with your kids, um, rolling each roll. Ours were very imperfect. Um <laughs> And they turned out great, so. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, part of what I really like about this recipe is that uh, it's a highly enriched dough. And so you've got eggs and sugar and milk and, importantly, sour cream that does the work of most of the, like, hydration instead mm -hmm. of just water. Um, but the other thing that makes these unbelievably soft is the use of a tang zhong. This was really cool. I'd never done this before. Yeah, and the the tang zhong is essentially a cooked down uh, like milk and flour, sometimes milk and water, and flour uh, starter, more or less. Mm -hmm. And so you cook down some liquid and flour into a paste, usually milk. Um, and so this is where you hear that term Japanese milk bread. It usually is referred to that because it's made with a tang zhong. But this small kind of portion of cooked flour becomes this paste that absolutely changes the entire structure of the bread. Mm -hmm. It is so soft and it holds on to so much moisture. It's just unreal. Yeah. We were talking about making these for like a Thanksgiving dinner or something like that where you can dip them. Oh, it'd be so good and great. <laughs> they were so good. <laughs> because the other thing about these, too, is that uh, you've got the acidity from the sour cream. And so she has you roll out this dough flat and then fill it with chopped chives. And that then gets folded uh, into the dough and you chop yeah, it, it up. It seemed like a lot, but when you're eating it, 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 wasn't, it yeah, wasn't too much. Not too much. It is a lot but not too much, and it's so good. <laughs> yeah, and then we did the egg wash on top that made them, you know, that beautiful golden top. And it shimmers. <laughs> and then she, of course, suggests that you uh, put on a whole two tablespoons of butter <laughs> on top while they're still hot. They were like puddles and of butter on Yeah, top. we didn't even do the full ta two tablespoons, and it still was like so much butter. But, oh, it, it worked. <laughs> and it really hit the spot. So um, I one kind of piece of, I think, uh, I don't know, bread suggestion? I don't even know <laughs> what word I've used for this in the past. I don't know. Bread tip. We'll call tip. it the bread tip. <laughs> the bread tip for this episode. My word, this is absurd. Um, <laughs> that right. <laughs> uh, <sighs> the bread tip here. I think is related to the Tang Zhong. And this has, uh, the, the short version is if 
you can include some amount of slightly cooked like flour mm-hmm. with some kind of liquid into your bread. And it doesn't matter which recipe we're talking about. Use a small portion of your flour and water and cook it down. Um, or milk, if that's what's in the recipe, to cook it down and add into the bread, it will absolutely change that structure, make it so much softer and hold on to that moisture a little better. All right. So I am here today with my brother, Christopher. Chris, I guess. Yep, <laughs> None uh, of my family has ever been able to shorten any name. So it's Christopher. <laughs> uh, yeah, my it old... is a little bit weird. <laughs> Uh, probably because all of your friends call you Chris and everybody you know except us. Yeah, it still sounds <laughs> weird when anyone, one of you, or call me Chris, which sometimes <laughs> happens. It's weird. It feels weird coming out of my mouth. So Christopher, my older brother. Um, I have four brothers. So my second oldest brother, Christopher. And we are going to be talking about um, growing up together. And my diagnosis. So I guess I'll just start off. Um, so in this, I we kind of talked about this on the last episode, just trying to talk about different stories and experiences that we've shared and we haven't shared and maybe haven't talked about before. Um, so I guess first, do you have what are your first memories of me and my diagnosis and diabetes? Um, so I mean the. The things that I remember now, um, I mean, I I can't even think about how long it's been. I remember at Disneyland or we were on a vacation Mm -hmm. and you were going to the bathroom a lot and mom and dad, I could tell were just acting weird about it. They, I could tell something was going on, but I was too young to really understand what that actually meant. Um, and it's interesting because it's almost like a movie in my head now because I remember being there on vacation and then I just remember being home and them taking you to the hospital. I don't remember <laughs> anything in between that. <laughs> and then uh, one of mom or dad, I can't remember who, probably dad's sat us down and told us that you had diabetes and that you were going to be in the hospital for a little bit. And even then, I don't think it actually clicked in like what that actually meant. I obviously didn't know what diabetes was at that point. And that it was like a lifelong thing. Sure. And I probably wasn't even like as nervous as I should have been with you being in the hospital. I just assumed <laughs> that the doctors would figure everything out and you'd be all right. Um, and then I remember going up to the hospital um, a couple days later, I think, uh, mm-hmm. with all of the, all of the other brothers. And yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of what I remember <laughs> from the first part of it. Did did mom and dad explain it to you? Like, how was it explained to you or was it just like this yeah, term I think in, diabetes? Our, our dad's pretty straightforward when he's explaining stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think he told us that your um, body was no longer producing insulin and that you were going to need to take medicine to um, to basically help you uh, get through it. And um that you were gonna have to take shots every day and check your blood and they started giving us like sort of like the baseline information sure is sort of what i remember and um but that was pretty much it they i think they started talking pretty early on about how we were gonna have to change our eating habits and not having certain things in the house anymore and Mm -hmm. we, we i remember them being very Dad being very, very clear that we were not to ever make you feel bad that we couldn't have candy in the house. <laughs> and, oh, and that's so, so classic. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, dang it. But like, really? <laughs> and like, not we because we had we used to have Kool-Aid all the time. And oh, my gosh. The sugared Kool-Aid. Oh, Happy so much juice. Sugar. Yeah. <laughs> just so many cups of like just tons of sugar in little teeny <laughs> cups of juice. <laughs> Um, and you know, that we were going to have to be a lot more careful about what we ate. And and so that's when it really started to sink in, you know, the changes that started happening, I think even before you got home from the hospital. That's so funny because I've never, I've never really heard that kind of part of it. So that's really interesting. Like the background, you know, when you aren't part of that, like conversation at home, but. You know, of course, mom and dad were always trying to make us feel or help us feel like accepted and 
you know, not <laughs> make each other crazy because <laughs> we already were doing that. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be interested to see and hear about what the other brothers sort of felt. I mean, I think we were all different ages and had yeah. different awarenesses of sure. what was actually going on at the time. And so yeah. to hear their perspective, I think will be interesting just because I obviously have memories in my head, but who knows, you know, 20 yeah. plus years later. Well, and also, those, yeah, also, <laughs> yeah. And kind of the stories we all retell, um, you kind of pick up on the story that's being told and not necessarily what you remember from it when you're little, you know, those kind of famous stories that you, (laughs) you know, hear told a bunch of times. And so then your memory kind of melts. Yeah. The the history just becomes the story that's being told. Yeah. And what actually happened is probably a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, do you remember anything specific about the hospital um, or how you felt coming into the hospital and seeing me there? I was excited to see you. I remember I remember walking in and turning left into the hospital room and seeing you in the bed. And I think we just like sat on the bed with you for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then they asked if we wanted to go see the Pac-Man machine <laughs> and... Um, you know, I, I remember they said the nurse was going to come in and talk to us. And, uh, you know, we did some of the other things like with the talking about the needles and you showed us checking your blood and things like that. I mean, mm-hmm. that's I sort of remember the the actions that we took once we were there. And that's about <laughs> it. Sure. The Pac-Man room was obviously the best thing about the hospital stay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I was most excited for. But <laughs> I'm still not quite grasping that you were going through a life altering it is funny Medical the things diagnosis. yeah and i mean how how old were you you were 11 or 12 i mean i'm two and a Bet- half years older than you so, so. you were like between 11 and 12 maybe 11 um, yeah at that point so i'd be as old as my oldest son tucker is now so like sixth grade yeah so it's interesting to kind of think at that age i always think that's interesting like thinking about when i see kids that age i'm like wow like this is the age that I was and I feel like my comprehension would be this certain <laughs> way. But then thinking back, I mean, that's it's been 25 years, if you can believe that, which is nuts. That's really weird <laughs> to think about. Yeah, <laughs> um, I do remember the fame. One of the famous family stories that is always told <laughs> is Christopher and the Orange. <laughs> um, and so I want to hear your perspective on this because. I feel like it's been sensationalized and probably because it felt sensational to you when it happened. Like anyway, so I'm curious to hear what you remember of it. And then if that differs from like how we tell it. Yeah. So the, the orange story um, started with um, like I mentioned earlier, they, they told us that the nurse was going to come in and teach us and show us how, how the needles worked and how you're going to have to get shots. And so that we could help, give you shots if we needed to and if you wanted us to and just so we could see that it wasn't all that scary and I was always super scared of needles back Mm -hmm. then and so I was super nervous about getting like they did like the saline shots for us and you literally could we couldn't feel anything I don't (laughs) think any of us could um, because the needles are so small but they wanted us to practice giving the shot on an orange before (laughs) um before we practice actually giving it to (laughs) Melissa. And so all this sounded great ever, you know, my other brothers, I remember them sticking their needle into the orange and they showed us how to do it and to push the saline into the orange and everything would be fine. And I don't, I honestly have no idea how it happened, but as I pushed the needle in, I, I, it must've been a bad orange or something (laughs) <laughs> because as I pushed the needle in, it just like slid all the way the needle halfway into the orange. Like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I just like froze. And then I pulled it out and like all the juice just came splurting out. And it was like the worst possible thing that I could have thought to happen. <laughs> like sticking a needle in someone else <laughs> is that I push too hard and it like goes into their arm and then it, their arm explodes as I pull it out. And so... 
I just remember Melissa was, I think I was sitting on the bed, the hospital <laughs> bed, like, and you were just watching it. And I remember your eyes going wide or, you know, that's part of this, <laughs> like you said, the story that we tell. I just remember you being like a uh, little bit in shock. Like Christopher is never going to give me a shot. <laughs> I don't know. How, did you ever give me a shot? I'm trying to remember. I think so. I mean, I, mean, I think we I think probably we all did. did just to... I think see what mom and dad, like. when you first came home, just so that like in an emergency situation or something, sure, we would be okay with it. And I, I feel like I remember giving it to you a couple times. Yeah. I um, wonder if it had just been like infiltrated by a lot of insulin, like we just been, or uh, we'd been shooting a lot of like saline yeah, into it. Yeah, maybe they might it have used the same, like, maybe they use the same orange ready to and explode. that's what <laughs> Yeah, all the other saline that had been shoved into it just, you know, <laughs> my little needle was couldn't too much take by it that anymore. Point. That's so yeah. funny. It's so funny that I remember like the visual of the orange, like innards, just like sp- I don't even know how to describe <laughs> it, like splooshing out of it, like it, yeah, and just thinking like. Been. Oh my gosh, is that like, can that happen to me? Like, <laughs> I don't think that would be possible in an arm. Like, it would be pretty aggressive to, yeah. I don't know, but I love that. Oh, I wonder I definitely what, never forgot. So. <laughs> I know. Um, so as part of growing up with me, we kind of talked about things that maybe like we were prepping to change. Are there any other things... Um, from growing up that changed or that you remember um, specifically? Um, I, I remember the counting carbs uh, went for all of us for like mm-hmm. the first two weeks or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it was even longer than that where we just had to become a little bit more aware of what, you know, the... Um, what the actual nutritional values of things were and learning what carbohydrates were and protein and what that did to you. And yeah, I think it was, like I said, I think it was a pretty quick change where mom sure. and dad removed some of the stuff from that we always had in the house, whether it was like crackers and snacks and stuff like that mm-hmm. um, to things that had, you know, less carbs just to make it easier on you. Sure. Um, and portion control. I remember like having to, um, them like using cups and half like cups measuring. and me- measuring everything for a while. And I mean, overall, it didn't, I don't feel like it changed all that much mm-hmm. other than the like super sugar stuff, which, you know, ended up not being all that much yeah. of a big deal. And, you know, it might've even helped me long-term because I just not a super sweet tooth yeah. anymore. And, you know, I think us not having sweets a lot through a pretty large portion of my childhood just sort of like you know pushed me in that direction so yeah it is kind of interesting I don't feel you kind of said like they were saying don't make her feel like bad about it and I never felt like I don't really remember those changes feeling significant at this point obviously at that point the most significant thing I remember was like having to figure out how to go to school (laughs) <laughs> and like I had to eat these very specific things at school lunch. But I think yeah. you guys did a really good job of helping me not feel like different, which I guess was kind of the aim um, that mom and dad had. But yeah, uh, it just it didn't require all that much change for us. Um, yeah, I don't I mean, I don't really remember it. having candy a lot. At ha- like we didn't really drink soda as kids or like. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of those things that could have maybe felt different, but I feel like we kind of still ate the same things and just sort of like the portions maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think that like the biggest change was going from Kool-Aid to Crystal Light. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We used, okay. So I guess we need to explain about the Kool-Aid and the happy juice. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I think it might've been, Probably mostly our older brother, or maybe that's just me blaming it on <laughs> on him. Well, but and the, the would, twins, we had this, yeah. our parents had these friends that would come and visit from California, right? I think. Yeah. And we would always do crazy things with them. 
So I think that kind of spurred on. We always were just doing crazy things. <laughs> yeah. So the happy juice was basically you made Kool-Aid, which already had, I think, like a cup or two full cups of sugar mixed in with like a two liter, <laughs> two liter pitcher. <laughs> and then we just would add like four more cups of sugar. Uh, I do and remember the sugar at the bottom of the cups. Like, yeah, whoa. it was quite insane thinking back on it <laughs> but and i'm sure it couldn't have tasted good no surely surely it yeah was we, we couldn't do that <laughs> we didn't do that anymore <laughs> um so tell me what you remember about diabetic camp when i guess when i i was probably 10 11 so you were probably 13 14 yeah. we mm -hmm. went to a diabetic camp and Christopher came along with me. Um, so I'm curious to hear about your experiences as a non-diabetic at a diabetic camp. Yeah, I mean, I was the, um, I was the one, it was, it seemed weird a little bit when I was first there because everyone else had diabetes and they all had to follow these procedures and check their blood and do these certain things. Um, and when I wasn't doing that, they were like, why aren't, like at first they're like, why aren't you doing this? Why? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm not diabetic. And then of course, you know, they're like, well, then why are you here? <laughs> and it's like, I'm just here with my sister who just got diabetes a little bit ago. And so I'm just here with her. And I don't know, like, I think there were a few other siblings who had come mm -hmm. who also didn't have diabetes, but it was, you know, like three people out of a hundred or something like that. Sure. Right? And so... I think it just normalized it for me, seeing that there were all these other kids who I had a lot in common with who were my age, who liked to skateboard and do these other things. And, you know, they all had diabetes and it didn't affect them in any weird way. And, mm -hmm. you know, the the meals that we had were all portion controlled and we got the specific things and I had to eat just like everyone else. And I think it it helped me sort of understand what you had to go through. And I think I even started because I think we went two years and I think the second year mm -hmm. I started doing the, I was doing blood tests every, every time I ever, everyone mm -hmm. else did. Sure. Um, and if, you know, I, there were some of the same kids that, that I was with the first year. Um, so they remembered me and it was just, it was just a fun time. Honestly, it was a fun time to be around them and get to learn a little bit more about, how your life was because as much as I remember you having to get, do your shots and do your blood tests and that mm -hmm. it wasn't an every day every hour thing for sure. me and you know getting to see all these other people doing it all the time like being around it for you know however long the camp was a week mm -hmm. you know it just gave me helped me sort of understand you know how constant it was for for you yeah I didn't really think about that like now of course it makes sense like oh okay this is like helping you understand kind of what it's like and that's really interesting um I am curious we're gonna have to ask mom and dad the reasoning by like why they sent you I mean I think I know because they're always protective right <laughs> and want us to be okay and you know whenever Steve has to go somewhere it's like okay someone's got to go out and be with Melissa like what could happen <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of interesting that kind of protection and I did it was I was super scared to go and like I'd never known any other diabetics or you know interacted with other people with diabetes so it was super interesting getting a perspective of like other people and like everybody else that had to do these same things. So um, the one thing I do remember, I don't, I don't think we've talked about this, but I feel like our family had started reading Harry Potter before diabetic camp. Do you remember this? And yeah, I, was I think bring it up. they read a chapter without us. And yeah, I, I did not we very upset. Well, okay. But I did not realize that they had read that I had never read. It was the first Harry Potter book. And the chapter where they like, spoilers, <laughs> Harry's like getting all these letters sent to him and they go out to the shack with the Dursleys and Hagrid appears. I never heard that chapter until in sixth grade, I was reading 
like during reading time and I read this chapter and I was like, I do not remember this. And I <laughs> didn't realize that they had read without us while we were at camp. So maybe you you realized that they had. I didn't realize until several years later. <laughs> well, I think I I've think never I read, read this uh, chapter. <laughs> I think because Matthew had read the book first. Right. And I think mm. I had snuck it. And I had, so I think I was halfway through when we started reading as a family. Oh, okay. So you'd already heard it. <laughs> so I, I had already heard it. And so I probably just didn't realize that they had skipped past. But I remember, <laughs> I feel like I remember you getting upset about it. No, did you even know? I didn't, I didn't know. And I vividly remember in sixth grade. <laughs> reading a chapter. Reading, reading it. Before. It's like the third chapter. It's like the very yeah, beginning of the book. So, on, yeah. I mean, but I feel like that chapter is like <laughs> crucial to the story. Like, yeah. you're a wizard. <laughs> So. <laughs> He's just all of a sudden at the like, platform nine like, and three quarters, I, and, I don't, and has all his stuff. I don't remember what I thought as a kid. Like, I guess I was just clueless. I don't know. <laughs> and too much and going I on at diabetic, diabetic camp. camp. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, diabetic camp. I'm gonna have to like do a whole episode on diabetic camp, um, and being like force fed cheese in the middle of the night and. Hating, Did you go low or something? Hating cheese. Yeah, they wake you up in the middle of the night every night to test you. This is long uh -huh. before insulin pumps were like oh, accessible true, for yeah. young kids. And so they'd wake us up every night and test our blood to make sure we weren't like dive bombing. And I was low this one night and I was crying because they wanted to give me this cheese. It was like warm cheese too. It was like like what those cheese thin cheese things that you put on burgers oh my yeah. gosh they're like oh. sheets <laughs> like plastic <laughs> like, sheet. like sheets of cheese yeah <laughs> just like, like the american cheese in the plastic yeah wrapper. trying to force me to eat this cheese and i was sobbing because i didn't want to eat this cheese <laughs> like the it's probably like craft or something yeah right? like craft like seagulls <laughs> that don't have to be refrigerated anyway that's like one well, of my uh, biggest ever <laughs> do they wake you guys up in the middle of the night I don't know if they ever woke me up. I mean, I probably woke up just because I everybody I else mean, they, was waking they, up. Everyone else was waking up, and they come in to do it. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember that actually, though. Yeah, very much. Good old Camp Utada. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think they still do that. Um, I'm not sure though. And I think it's great, especially especially for younger kids because as much as like we just didn't know anyone else who had diabetes or anything yeah. similar to it mm -hmm. at yeah. the time i it was a really interesting time to like meet other diabetics and i think i did meet the one diabetic that i went to school with but then we were never like in the same class i mean we went to huge huge schools so yeah. it's easy to just not run into people but um so we've kind of been talking about like childhood memories. <laughs> um, so how I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question in a way that makes sense outside of my brain. <laughs> um, how is obviously our relationship has changed as like adults and like as relationships change when you're in your adulthood. Um, how has your kind of relationship to my diabetes changed and shifted from like childhood to adulthood. Does that make sense? I guess like, I guess yeah. how does, how does the framework of me being a di type one diabetic feel to you now that we are adults and like you kind of understand the like, cause I feel like as children, you kind of, you know, it's, Oh, it's this thing. Like I, for reference, when I, was in college I remember reading something about um life expectancy of people with type 1 diabetes and I never even thought about like having a shortened life expectancy like obviously that's changed since I was nine um and people like treatments are so much better that people are like living longer but I you know I think that maybe was sheltered from me and I'm like not upset about that, but it was kind of shocking to me as an adult. I think the more you kind of understand more seriously the effects of diabetes and things like that happen um, and can happen. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think I, 
I still get, I'm a lot more nervous, I think, um, Mm -hmm. about certain things. You know, there's been times when you've gone low, um, and, uh, you know, especially going through, um, carrying a child and things like that. It's just obviously there's always, you know, worry, especially living so far away, Mm -hmm. um, and not being able to help if, uh, if you needed it. I mean, I think it's interesting because like you said, treatments have gotten so much better. And even when I'm around you now, I hardly notice any of it because it's all mostly taken care of through your pump. And I don't even understand how the pump works and what, um, you know, what it's doing, what sort of, uh, all the steps that it takes out of your hands compared to what we used to have to do, because the last, you know, the last time I was around you a ton was in, you know, when we were both living in Logan, going to Utah state. Mm -hmm. And I still feel like, had you just gotten your pump at that point? Your first one? Yeah, I, yeah, because in 2009, which wasn't Tucker born in 2009? Yeah, he was. Yeah, that's the year I got it that summer before I went to Switzerland, so. Yeah, I mean, I remember you still pricking your fingers all the time, Mm -hmm. and um, (laughs) yeah, still doing the shots, and I mean, I don't think that it, I, I recognize diabetes more in the world around me just Mm -hmm. because obviously of of the connection with you. Sure. And so I've met other people who have, you know, other friends who have diabetes who um, I've talked to a little bit about it and it's more just um, an awareness of what it is and how it affects you. And, you know, the, um, but I, I still don't feel like I understand all that much how, how much it affects you on a day-to-day basis. Sure. Just because I haven't been around it for so long. And I feel like when you first were diagnosed, we were all very close and saw everything that you had to do and had a really good understanding of just how like minute by minute you're always, it's always something that you have to think about in the back of your head. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I've lost a little bit of that, just not being around you as much. And even when I am around you, like I said, you have your pump now and sure. it takes care of a lot of that. And so I feel like I don't know as much as I probably should. Mm-hmm. anymore um and uh you know aside from like i i see an article and i click on it because it says diabetes <laughs> when sure. you know it's like when you get a new car and all of a sudden you see that car driving around everywhere on the road or mm-hmm. you know something like that so um my you know i'm always if i ever see it anywhere stories about it or new treatments and things like that it's always it's always eye catching to me, but I feel like I remember back in, you know, 15, 17 years ago when there was a huge breakthrough and they were going to be able to fix it, fix the <laughs> insulin problem in type one diabetes people and they're going to be cured. And and that obviously has taken longer than sure. the article suggested. At the time. <laughs> I feel like they're releasing articles all the time, like the cure, the cure. It's just around the corner and. I feel like I've kind of been desensitized to that because it feels like, you know, like, okay, here's another article about a cure, you know? Um, Although there is, you know, there's some really great science going on with that. But I think for me, at least, it's kind of like exhausting (laughs) to be like, oh, here's a cure. But it's like, oh, okay, I guess when it comes, it comes, you know, and whatever that is at whatever point, you know, mom is always, you know, there'll be a cure. I know there's going to be a cure, you know, that like hope of a cure, you know, (laughs) Yeah. but it is kind of interesting, you know, when you are removed from something, I think that's kind of why we're doing the podcast and why we're like having these conversations, you know, because I feel like we are so deeply entwined as siblings. um, And this was a huge part of our, childhood right (laughs) and I think yeah it really was I think a lot of times obviously we kind of think inside of ourselves and I'm like oh this was huge for me but it was huge for you guys too you know the lows that would happen and you know as a kid it's scary because you don't really like you were kind of saying like I didn't know really you don't really know to think like okay diabetes what are the implications of this right it's just like okay, how is this affecting my day today? Like, okay, we're not going to have 
Kool-Aid, <laughs> you know? Um, so it is kind of interesting to hear that kind of change into adulthood too. And this like desire to maybe know more, but that's, a, I feel like on me too, um, kind of, I've always felt secretive about it. Right. Like tried to just, you know, do my shot in the bathroom or, you know, <laughs> just, okay, click my pump really quick. I think that need to not like make it a big deal because when it is a big deal, it's a big deal, right? Those lows. Well, do you do you feel like that was the same when you were younger? Because I feel like when you were younger and it was just us and the siblings and family, like you were just like you were like super gung ho to just do it. You're excited <laughs> to show everyone, and yeah, I don't know how much of that was just you trying to put on a brave face, or how much yeah. of it was, you know. I think, you know, we, like you said earlier, I think mom and dad set us up to really support you yeah and or at least do our best to support you yeah and so you know make it so that it was just a thing that you know we you know we all knew you did and you did it you know you, you would give your shots in front of us all the time back yeah then. and I don't I don't ever remember feeling shy or like vulnerable in front of you guys I think that was probably more of a like going through like middle school <laughs> you know and like yeah having those experiences as that age. And I think it would be interesting to know like people who grow up with diabetes and go through this phase, like, is there something about that sort of that makes you feel more shy and self-conscious? Like if there's certain things, you know, I, I think I've talked about this before, but someone in high school saying, you know, I'd never marry someone who is diabetic because then our kids would be diabetic diabetic like things like that that like just you know when someone says that like they of course don't think anything of it like they just are making this dumb statement that <laughs> means nothing to them because they just you know what I mean but yeah. those sort of things you internalize and I think I think in I don't know maybe that's something in sort of my internal like I'm not like embarrassed that I'm diabetic, but I just have this like need to not feel like I'm sick or that I need help or that I'm like at any minute going to like drop and go low. You know what I mean? Even with the worries that family has for you. Like, yeah, well, and I mean, I wonder how I assume that's how a lot of people feel um, mm -hmm. when it comes down to you know, you, you have those experiences like that person saying, I'd never marry someone who has diabetes and not really understanding, you know, right. what it is or that it, you know, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, cause I remember very early on, they, they kept driving at home that like, um, I think back then they were saying that if someone, if a kid got diabetes, it was less likely for the older siblings to get it but the younger siblings had a slightly higher chance of getting it or something like that. And I don't know. I remember that just stuck with me. I don't know how true that is. If that's actually, hmm. um, because I think it was still, they were still doing so much research back then. Mm -hmm. It was still, it seems like it was, um, you know, they've come a long way in terms of recognizing it and finding it earlier and things like that. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was, I, I, even though they would tell me that I was always worried that I was going to end up getting it too. Mm -hmm. um, that is interesting. Way back then. So that's crazy. <laughs> the fear of being diagnosed. Yeah. I remember mom and dad being nervous and like checking Marcus and Andrew all the time because they were nervous about that. But I didn't really ever think about someone telling them like that it was more likely. Well, I don't know that I can't remember if it was the nurses at the hospital or I just remember hearing it. Sure. Um, I mean, it was so know, long right ago. After. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I think as I've as I've gotten older in my relationship with it, I think, you know, we all we obviously still talk about it as a family a lot. Um, right. You know, and it, usually it's only around like a an event when like, oh, you've got you when you got your new pump or like you said, when you did go low one time or something like that. Mm -hmm. And those are the sort of the stories that like stand out. It's not really the day to day just living with it and how much, sure. you know, 
it's crazy. Uh, this is why I want to do this, right? Like, so we talk about it and understand each other's kind of feelings and, you know, um, experiences. So do you, you've kind of been, obviously we live states away. Um, and so I'm curious to know when I have had kind of these scary lows and obviously the story kind of trickles to you, (laughs) right? Yeah. Um, I guess, does that feel, how does that feel to you? And how does, does it feel almost easier to not know the day to day? You know what I'm saying? Like, because those moments are really scary. And so then it's like shock to your system. Like, oh yeah, this like reminder, like this is like this life and death sort of. Well, yeah. And I think the, you know, when you, when you were pregnant and went low and I ended up hearing like through the grapevine, Mm -hmm. because I don't think we've ever actually even talked about what happened and how you felt during all of it. I've just heard secondhand through, I think it might've even been Marcus or someone who was giving me the rundown of everything that happened. And just like, I mean, just being so worried that, um, you know, something might happen and, you know, having flashbacks to media play (laughs) and other times when you would go low and really feeling, feeling helpless and not, you know, I feel like we understood things to do for you. Like, you know, giving you the glucose. Sure. Glue gel stuff. (laughs) That's so gross. (laughs) (laughs) Or like the tablets. I remember we would would always have the tablets, the chalk tablets, um, the chalk tablets and like juicy juice. Mm-hmm. Um, boxes, and we were not allowed to ever have any of your juicy <laughs> juice boxes because <laughs> they were for you and you went low, and that was like and um. But I mean, cut to now. Uh, like you said, we live we live very far away, and it is a shock when I hear, you know, and I hear that happen, and I wonder, like, are there other times when you've gone low? And it was, you know, you were lucky enough to be close to Steve or he was home or Mm -hmm. other things like that. And how many times is that happening more frequently, less frequently with your pump? You know, is it because it still just can happen so quick sometimes. Sure. Um, And how you deal with that and how, you know, as you as you get older and have to continue to sort of find your way through all of it is, you know, what what support if any do you need from us and how much do you want to know how much do you want us to know about stuff like that because sure i don't want i don't want to ever put pressure on you to make um to make you feel like you're not telling us enough or you're not sure you know explaining all this stuff because like you said it is it is a personal thing and you know they're you know you don't want us to treat you differently or you know handhold you or you know (laughs) when we're with you be like always asking you like, Oh, can are you, you low? This? Are, you you this? are you low? <laughs> sure. You know, you know, b- basically being acting as like a hall monitor to make sure you're <laughs> doing things the right way. And so I don't know if that makes me feel like I ask less questions because I don't want it to, sure. I don't want it to be a thing. You know? Right. It just, right. But it is a thing. And if it's something that, you know, you think it would help to share stuff with it. Sure. You know, I just I don't ever want to make you feel different. And that's a really weird thing to say because um, because you have type one diabetes and I don't. And so there is a difference there and mm-hmm. how, you know, I just I've never really, I think, done a very good job reaching out and finding out how you want us as the siblings and, sure. you know, some of the people you're closest with to treat you in those type of situations or on a more consistent basis? You know, do you yeah. want us to check in and, and ask about that? Or do you want to just stick to, <laughs> you know, our cute kids and all the silly things that they do and, <laughs> and say, you know? Yeah. I, I've never really thought about it in that way. And it's interesting because when those kind of scary lows, like the one we talked about with the, in the episode with Steve, when those kind of things happen, I think there's this like overwhelm and like, we didn't really talk about this on the episode, but the next day it was just like, 
we both called off work and we just like laid in bed and cried all day because it was just this like traumatic experience. And I think in that is sort of this like, not that I don't want to tell you all about it and share with you all about this experience because I feel like we are a very close family and we talk about everything and share everything. And I feel like it's not so much that as like, it's exhausting, (laughs) you know? And also I hate to scare you guys, you know? And I think that's mostly what it is, is I don't want to scare you. (laughs) And that seems silly when I say it out loud, but like, I obviously know how much you all care about me and love me and want the best for me. And so I think when those things happen, it's more like if I tell them this, then there's fear, you know, and then they're going to be afraid, you know, and be more aware of how intense this is and how scary it can be because those those things don't happen a lot. You know, I can count on my two hands how many scary lows that I can remember, right? Like, so they don't happen a lot, but when they do, they're huge. And I think that's why they kind of become these like family lore stories. And, you know, now that we've talked about this, I think it's important for me too to hear like how you guys are feeling about it as well, because I think we all experience these things side by side, right? And we all experience them differently. And that's kind of why I wanted to do these interviews is to talk about how we experience diabetes together because it is everybody I know is experiencing this with me obviously they're not experiencing like every day all these things but you guys are experiencing the emotions of it um um, yeah and I mean I'm a very you know all, all of the five of us kids are pretty wildly different people and I'm a very <laughs> Yes. Passive person. Mm -hmm. And I know mom will chuckle hearing this, but I just I'm if if there's conflict or something going on, I'm just going to, you know, let things play out and be there if someone reaches out. But I'm not going to, like, put myself out there all the time and be pressing for sure. You know, I think the way that you would probably do it if you knew something (laughs) was going on with me, you'd be texting me and calling me all the time. What's happening? And that just that just. You know, that's just sort of the dynamic that I think that we have and the space where I'm comfortable in it and is just, you know, being there if I if people reach out. But I'm I'm pretty bad about reaching out a lot of times. Yeah. Um, And even, you know, when I do, you know, reaching out and at the same time, putting myself out there and asking about how these things are going, aside from just the passing, like, are things going OK with your sure. numbers? How are your numbers doing? You know? <laughs> sure. Um, we mentioned media play. <laughs> Let's talk about media play. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, I feel like all of us who were there, and I think it probably changes who was actually there. I think it was I all of us. Remember, I, talked, I don't remember who I was talked there. to Dad a couple days ago, and was it everyone? I think it was all of us because I think it was one of those moments where Mom like needed a break, like get the kids out of the house. <laughs> It's kind of funny, like, the older I get, the more I understand mom and dad. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I did love media play, too. Yeah, (laughs) media play, man. (laughs) Um, So, I guess, what do you remember from media play? Do you want me to frame the story? (laughs) I mean, yeah, I'm I'm happy to give my account of it. I I do wonder how... (laughs) different all the siblings accounts will be i remember because because we were pretty close um i don't know if it was just an age thing but even just being in media play like i think we were walking around looking at the around the cd aisles Mm -hmm. and i feel like you were like you grabbed onto me a few times which was weird because you didn't ever do that yeah and i don't know if you were just balancing yourself or you if you were just um I, Not really I with it because it it, <laughs> it came on a little bit slow and I feel like you were just acting weird. And I remember being embarrassed that you were <laughs> acting so silly. I think I was yeah. laughing. I remember laughing. You a were lot. giggling like crazy. <laughs> and I was just like, what? 
what is going like, on? So Melissa? embarrassed. Like, <laughs> Stop. <laughs> like, I just remember being like thinking you were just trying to like annoy me or something at first. <laughs> and you... then walking up to the front. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I remember hear. walking up to the front and I think dad was checking out and he maybe told us to go on ahead or something like that. Some of us to go out to the car. So I remember I was in front of you and then you weren't behind me anymore and I turned around and you had fallen over. I just remember you being on the ground mm -hmm. and dad like just dropping everything, knocking everything over out of the way <laughs> to get to you as fast as possible. And him yelling. I, I don't remember if it was me. I think I remember like grabbing the lemonade or something and handing it to him. And I remember I've talked to you about this a little bit. I was so nervous that we hadn't paid for the lemonade yet that that's all I thought about. I was like, dad didn't pay for it. And he just like dumped a bunch of lemonade onto her while she was laying <laughs> on the ground <laughs> and it's all over the floor. And so I remember being like, I remember those like weird. I'm, you know, a 12 or 13 year old right. kid. Embarrassed. Or, in, I don't even know if I was embarrassed. I, I definitely was super nervous and worried about you because mm -hmm. I think I was old enough to realize that it was an actual like scary thing. Like I thought you were having a seizure or faint, sure. like fainting. Like I didn't, I knew enough to know that when you went low, you could faint and, um, and things like that. So, I but I think I had mostly only seen you, been around you when you were high and, mm -hmm. and you just ragey. get pretty agitated. <laughs> And mean. And so this was this <laughs> Everyone was leave different. Melissa alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we need to talk about that at some point. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> well, I feel pretty bad about some of that. <laughs> about me being high? Well, yeah. I, we used to... I feel like we would say... Like, torment me? Oh, uh, you're just high. Like, anytime you'd say <laughs> something mean to us, I'd be like, go check your blood. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big thing. Like, are you high? Like, just yeah. being asked that all the time. And I think about that a lot. Like... Because it wasn't just at home. It was like when we were out or like, I just think about what people thought <laughs> when oh they're gosh, like, especially yeah. when I was a little bit older, like teenager <laughs> and my mom is like, are you high? Like yeah. in that tone, like, <laughs> are you high? Like you're clearly like, and I would get so mad because I'm like, can't I be angry just because I'm angry? <laughs> like, not just because I have high blood sugar, like I could be, but I always was high. Like it was like, <laughs> I, I would get those pissed. remember coming out of your mouth. <laughs> Can't I just be angry because I'm angry? <laughs> like, I would get so mad. Like, it would, like, accelerate the anger because I was being asked if I were high. Go check your blood. And I'd get so mad. Like, don't tell me what to do. Like, yeah. I'll test my blood when I want to. <laughs> and, I mean, back to the media play thing, I, I remember feeling really bad as soon as I realized, like, that you were, uh, that it was something as serious as it was because I was, like, feeling embarrassed that you were acting so weird <laughs> and being wacky and giggling and sure, you know, and then, you know, the quick turnaround to all of a sudden you were on the floor and not moving very much. And mm -hmm. it was, it was super scary for me. Yeah. Um, I always, it's always interesting for me to hear kind of what other people witness and feel when those things happen, because obviously like it's frightening to me happening to me, but, I imagine watching it, watching like this happening to someone else is a whole different level of scary. <laughs> um, and it seems like you were probably right at that age of like realization um, and sort of understanding, like you were saying, the implications of it a little bit more. Um, I do remember <laughs> falling into the carts um, and dad being like, take it. Cause I think what had happened is we had gone to go to media play. We were going to stop there and then go get food. And this is at the time when I would give myself insulin like half an hour before eating. Um, and so I'd given myself insulin and then we'd left to go get food, but we made this stop at media play. And so then I, of course, wasn't getting food and we probably took longer because I don't remember why. I wonder if anyone remembers why we were going to media play. Like, were we going <laughs> to purchase something i don't know it's just an maybe I mean, we just we liked have going allowance there. and we liked going there they had pokemon cards and cds and movies mm -hmm. and we just we went there all the time somewhere like, somewhere to get us out of the house 
Yeah. Um, but I do remember that. I do have this vague memory of like you specifically like embarrassing. Like I have this weird memory of that. And I don't know if it's because that's how we've kind of told each other the story or I just remember feeling weird and like laughing and then not knowing why I was laughing <laughs> and sort of yeah. that like foggy in between time <laughs> when you're like feeling like you could pretend like nobody knows you're being weird but you're being super weird <laughs> I feel yeah. like anytime I go low and I'm like at work or like in a public sphere it's like this sort of okay how how long can I go and not like people won't notice that this is happening <laughs> like, Just how normal can it, I no. how normal can I act because I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine like I think that's kind of that like internal like wanting everybody to think I'm fine all the time you know um yeah and when you say the carts I feel like that's maybe what got my attention is the noise of you like hitting into the mm -hmm. carts or whatever it was because I Maybe was Matthew right was behind me or I will have to yeah. ask him what he remembers. But I do remember the lemonade being like poured down my face and like the taste of lemonade. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> it's always sad that like the drinks at the checkout are always like Sprite and soda, like soda options, because it's like you can't chug that. Like you can't drink yeah. that quickly with like, <laughs> ew, you know, Um yeah. But I do remember I had to miss a swim meet the next day and it was like devastating <laughs> because yeah. I was I loved swimming and I was like just starting out and we had this big swim meet. And I remember having to miss that and just crying in the ambulance because <laughs> they told me I couldn't go to my swim meet. <laughs> and I don't know, I feel like I cry a lot when I'm low because there's this like wake up when you wake up from it because you know, I sort of passed out and then I was out of it. And then in the ambulance, kind of just all of a sudden realizing like what was happening. Yeah. So there's like this emotional, like wake up, <laughs> is, I guess what you call it. But um, this is kind of the biggest family lore. <laughs> Melissa's diabetes <laughs> is media yeah, I'm play. To, I'm trying <laughs> to think of some others because I just I don't feel like there were a ton of them. I um, don't you know, like we. Yeah, I don't we think about, I you had... did good. You were high quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And it is funny to think about that, like us saying that out in public. <laughs> what other people might have thought. <laughs> sure. And I, I do feel bad about it now because I do recognize how often, you know, you would be angry or you just anything that you did that we could, you know, connect to you being high mm -hmm. and that's why you're being the way that you are i don't know like why that was a thing for us but it just you know i feel like we said it a lot more than we probably should i have. feel like it was almost like melissa's sweet and she's like kind and so like if she's acting mean or angry in any way like it's not her like it's something has to be causing this anger right like and i think a yeah. lot of a lot of how women are kind of trained to be like kind and all this stuff like we obviously in recent years there's been a lot more conversation about this and i think that's kind of how we've like trained women right like when you're angry there has to be some reason that you're angry like you can't just be angry and I, I've never really thought about that in the context of my diabetes which is really interesting um that you brought it up that way because I feel like and you feeling bad about it, right like and this like realization later on like I was obviously saying this but in anger like can I just be angry <laughs> like because I'm well, angry yeah, and I right it, yeah we, I think we you know after a while we we could definitely tell sometimes mm -hmm. when you were actually high because it would be like something minute that would all of a sudden just, just like trigger flip you over the edge <laughs> and um and so like those t are the times when i feel like we wouldn't <laughs> we wouldn't say <laughs> oh you must be high we would just like We'd just be like, when was the last time you checked your book? We'd be more considerate about sure. it. Sure. Right? And 
it was the other times when we were probably just upset with you or something and sure. we knew you probably weren't high but we were just angry and we knew it would make you mad <laughs> and so we'd say that and it um sibling rivalries just, yeah <laughs> we it all just, did uh, mean things to each other right like and pushed each other's buttons and yeah and uh, like exactly because that was how you pushed my buttons <laughs> we, <laughs> you knew, knew. we knew it would frustrate you <laughs> Uh, you don't have to, I mean, I don't think you need to feel bad. I feel like you guys were always like worried, like concerned about me in an amount that I felt I didn't feel annoyed at, you know what I mean? Like I always knew that you guys had my back and like, it was kind of comforting to know that you guys could, you know, you lived with me all these years and could like realize you know and you had this huge responsibility put on you as like taking care of me right like because anything could happen anytime and you'd experience these things so I think as siblings especially <laughs> how our family works we're all super close and like care about each other in a way that I don't think makes sense to a lot of people and I don't think I realized that until <laughs> I like went out into the real world and people's siblings and relationships weren't how ours are. <laughs> so we obviously have like a special connection and I'm curious to know like how much this sort of like circumstances kind of solidified that, you know? Yeah. I mean, it definitely brought us together in a way that, um, I, I don't know if forced is the right word, but we were sort of all forced to go through this with you with some of the changes that we talked about with, you know, monitoring the diet and, mm -hmm. you know, becoming aware and having to be conscious all the time of, um, you know, the the signs of you going low and what we were needed to do in that situation. And, you know, learning the different types of insulin that you could have in the um the quick acting and the slow acting kind and, mm -hmm. you know, if when to give you protein and when to give you carbs and mm -hmm. all that type of stuff. Um, and learning that you needed to eat like protein before you went to bed so that it would last longer overnight. And so we just have like peanut butter snacks before <laughs> bed at night. and, you know, things like that. And it, we were just sort of put into that situation. And I think, um, you know, I I haven't ever thought about that as being a contributing factor to why we're so close. But, you know, all the. All of that at a very sort of influential time in all of our lives, I mean, what we were five to 15 mm -hmm. or to 14. I mean, Matthew and Andrew are 10 years apart and the others of us are just two and a half years in between. And so, sure. you know, all of us, you know, sort of had a. A different experience but all it was all the same experience for you and us the way that we were taught to treat you and look after you was you know the same all the way around regardless of if it was Matthew or Andrew yeah thanks for being with me and talking and <laughs> remembering weird things and sad things and I don't know thanks yeah, for being the first talk thanks about. for being the first first sibling interview <laughs> Yep. No Four, problem. three more to come. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to hear. I wonder if, I wonder if we shouldn't let the others listen to any of these <laughs> until they're all done, just so that we get clear stories that aren't aren't uh, biased, <laughs> aren't biased from my probably sometimes not 100 <laughs> accurate rememberings. But I feel like that's part of the like my fascination with the story is we've all heard this story. A thousand times. And so <laughs> I think that's what makes it most interesting is we've all heard everybody's story, right? And so it is kind of interesting how that sparks memory, too. Like when you were talking about it and looking at the CDs, like it sparked my memories, too, of like what had happened. <laughs> yeah, so. it's interesting how you can just like place yourself back in mm -hmm. that room. Um, I know some people like recall memories differently I like for me I just all of a sudden I'm back in those rows that were in the middle of media play with all the <laughs> CDs just stacked up and down mm -hmm. and remembering you like giggling <laughs> all at half like 
I honestly had no idea what it was at the time, but you were acting pretty drunk. <laughs> uh, that's kind of what it's it is. Way to yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember what CD you were buying at the I time? Have no idea. I mean, <laughs> that would be true memory. That would be our dad's memory. He probably remembers what CD he was buying. Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was around the time I would have been looking at like Offspring or Vertical Horizon or something. I feel like off, Offspring is a pretty safe bet. <laughs> You know, they, my interest in them has waned over the years. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thanks. Yeah, no problem. It was fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of Diabetic Highs and Lows. Uh, it was really great talking to my brother, Christopher, and kind of getting new insights from him and together as we walked through the interview process. Um Join us next week for another episode. And uh, wherever you're listening, go ahead and like and subscribe. Uh, if it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts, go ahead and leave us a review. It does make a difference. And uh, reach out to us on Instagram uh, with any of your thoughts and or comments related to this episode or ideas for future topics. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.